Senator Peter Anyang Nyongo, political scientist and politician, welcome to the JSO interview. Thank you very much, John. I would like to address you more as a political scientist than a politician on this occasion, mm -hmm. and in the particular context of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Organization of African Unity Stroke African Union on May the 25th. It all began 50 years ago in 1963. Perhaps you might begin by evoking those days of birth. Well, you know, when the OAU was born, the inspiring figure behind the OAU was Kwame Nkrumah, the then president of Ghana. And the first Secretary General, Diallo Tele from Guinea, paired very well as a founding Secretary General of AU. The vision then was that Africa must unite. In fact, Nkrumah's book, Africa Must Unite, encompasses the whole vision of African unity for which the OAU was founded. The other inspiring figures of those days, of course, was Mwadevo Julius Nyerere, who, unlike Nkrumah, had a gradualist approach to African unity. Nkrumah wanted Africa to unite immediately. Nyerere, on the other hand, thought that we should go step by step. By and he wasn't alone in that. He wasn't he alone in that. He was joined by people like Senghor. Sure. Basically, the Francophone countries who said, we'll yeah. take our time to, yeah. to link up with our Anglophone brothers and exactly, sisters. Exactly, exactly. Now, the danger of that, of course, as you remember, is that it is better to bend the stick when it is younger. When a, a tree grows farther, it's much more difficult to bend it. And my, my interpretation is that African countries would have found it much easier, African nations would have found it much easier to unite politically in those early days before people settled in their seats as presidents and prime ministers and tested the swiftness of power. Well, I, I take that, uh, but we'll go back to two things. You evoke the figure of Nkrumah. Yeah. Uh, this was the man who came with this sort of grandiose scheme with the Gamal Abdel Nasser's of Egypt and yeah. saying Africa must unite immediately. Yeah. But by the time he'd finished with himself, there he was, uh, the creator of the one-party state, uh, co having people refer to him as Osage for the Great Redeemer and uh, as dictatorial as the best of them. Well, so that, isn't, that, that, isn't that a tacit criticism? Precisely, you see, this the, the, the point I'm making, uh, that, that if Africa had united earlier, it could have prevented the emergence of autocratic leaders in single nations. But you see, some of these figures were too big for their own nations. Uh, but at the same time, you must remember the challenges that uh, they faced at that point in time. Uh, there was this young nation of Ghana born with a very ambitious leader, with ambitious projects like the Volta Dam projects and so on. And at that point in time was a Cold War. And on the one hand, there was the West led by the United States of America and the East led by the Soviet Union, two systems that were competing. And that competition was brought to the continent of Africa. The East was very much pro-African unity. The West wasn't quite enthusiastic about African unity because they were the former colonial masters in Africa. The U.S. wasn't the former colonial master in Africa, but the U.S. was interested in replacing former colonial masters to become the new dominant force in Africa. If you remember the history of the Congo and why Doug Hammarskjöld, the then Secretary General of the uh, United Nations Organization, died while trying to create peace in, in, in Congo. Right, Congo, well, we, we, we go in straight into that whole thing of the, the assassination of Patrice Lumumba yes. with proven fact so many years on that with the complicity of Belgium and the United exactly, States, yeah. nothing to be discussed, but we can't go into that depth of analysis. No. I will though, Senator, take you back to this quote, yeah. the famous Nkuruma quote, yeah. seek ye first, first the political kingdom and all things shall be added unto, unto you. you. So you're saying in a nutshell that Nkrumah was correct and was history correct. has borne him out. Definitely. History has borne it out the following year, John. Look at Europe. The Europeans started with economic integration. They are not still uh, cooperation in Europe after the Second World War. But they moved very quickly towards political union. And they realized that if they don't have political yeah. unity. But I, 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 you're, you're, you're the expert, but I would tell you that the, perhaps we shouldn't go there, but the European Union is falling apart. 
where, even as we speak, it has much to commend it, but they're not so many years on. It might not exist but, but, because but, they pursued the economic agenda uh, much to the favour of the political. Yes, they have did. Been. They did, but in the in in the end, they found that that the economic agenda cannot really be sustained for too long without the political unity. Mind you. The crossing of borders in Europe without passports will never be dismantled. It's a thing that has come here to stay. The harmonization of labor relations and capital flows will never be dismantled. It's a thing that is there to stay. Certain things may be tinkered with, and Britain as an island state, which has been very cautious about entering Europe, may withdraw from the European Union uh, in certain aspects, but main Europe is unlikely to fall apart as far as the political union is concerned. So I, I really think that um, it was more in the Africa, Africa's interest to unite, even more than Europe, because Africa needed to galvanize its meager resources and to galvanize its tremendous potential as a continent full of raw materials and other resources. It would be much easier to have a common infrastructure program for Africa than letting each African country try to struggle with their infrastructure as we are seeing at the moment. Right, let's go back to another major sort of bastion of conversations, uh, so to speak. Yeah. This idea that uh, one of the tenets was that nobody was going to change the colonial boundaries. They had to stay. As a political scientist, again, was that the right move? Because it has borne, you know, for the, for the, 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 the benefit of our viewers, this whole notion of, of people who are the same being split by some sort of fictional border. So that close to Kenya, in Uganda, you might find, you know, half the populace is Samir, one end, and the other end is um, Kenyan. Uh, Ugandans, Kenyan Samirs, Ugandan Samirs, Tanzanians Maasai, Kenyan Maasai, Kenyan Somalis, Somali Somalis. Well, if we had had a political union, that issue would not have been problematic because it would have been easier for Kenyan Somalis and uh, Somali Somalis to, to relate with each other without the menace of borders. But once we kind of downplayed or delayed union, uh, then the borders became a menace. And the borders actually became a source of conflict among certain countries uh, which have these populations across the borders. And I think that at that point in time, African heads of state thought that to limit possible areas of conflict, let us not fight each other as uh, regarding where the borders are. That was just to limit the potential sources of conflict. But if conflicts were to be dealt with much more imaginatively, political union would have done it much better. But having missed political union at that point in time, we must still remember, as you say, uh, that we are really doing a big disservice to separating African peoples across borders so that you are in Samia and you are in Uganda, your relatives are in Kenya, and coming into Kenya becomes an issue of you getting a passport and a visa to cross the border to see your relatives. I think this kind of thing is really, is really inhuman, to, to tell you the truth. Take, for example, the Awori family. Part of the family is in Uganda, part of the family is in Kenya, but one family. That border is a real menace to them, I must tell you. Right, and, and, and in that particular <laughs> family that you cite, and, you know, what mem certain members of the family hold high political posts in exactly. one country, yeah. and again would have perhaps problems going to see their cousins, yes, aunts exactly, and uncles exactly. across the border. Yeah, yeah. Right, done. No military intervention into another country was one of the basic tenets uh, in the days when it was the organization of African unity. Fast forward to the modern times, we do have African peacekeeping forces going into other nations to sort out uh, abuses, human rights violations and the like. Great leap forward, obviously, from what you've been saying. Yes, I, I think, I think the, 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 the manner in which African nations are intervening into the affairs of other nations is it, it, not a unilateral decision by one nation that um, we are going to intervene. You see what I mean? It is a collective decision under the AU which simply says that, look, there's a problem across the border. Let us not sit by and see our brothers and sisters butchering each other for nothing. Let's go in there and try and sort it out 
and live when there is peace so that the nation state can now, now be built peacefully. I, I think this is a justified intervention. Now, what the AU, OAU uh, principle of non-intervention was trying to uh, achieve then was to say, we know that, for example, the Guineans might think that the Anyi people in Côte d'Ivoire are part and parcel of the Akan people in Ghana. So let's go and unite our Akan people with the Anyis in Côte d'Ivoire. That kind of intervention is what was to be prevented because otherwise it would have led to a lot of chaos across the continent.